Now, it's always dangerous if the chair is uh, timing themselves. So Jenny has threatened me with a painful death by strangulation if I use up the coffee break again. Um, so uh, I'll try not to do that. Um, so the title of my talk is uh, about how ecosystems respond to escalating drivers. And it follows on very nicely, uh, particularly from uh, the last two talks um, by Jamie and, and, and by Nick. Um, I have to admit, I put this talk together um, yesterday and very early this morning. Um, it's going to be a talk which is uh, more or less data free. So it's very much work in progress. Uh, it's probably pretty raw, but I, I hope you'll find it um, idea rich and, and concept rich. So I'm look, basically at the stage of this project looking for feedback um, from uh, people in the audience. So as, uh, as Nick alluded to, I've been studying uh, regime shifts or phase shifts for uh, a very long time. So I started my career as an undergraduate um, in Jamaica um, uh, in the 1970s. And at that point, Jamaican coral reefs were dominated by these two species of branching Acropora, which today are on the uh, endangered species list or threatened species list. And that's the condition of uh, many Jamaican reefs today. It's undergone a so-called phase shift from corals to um, macroalgae. Uh, and here's some data that shows that. So the top graph here is percent coral cover. The bottom is percent macroalgae cover. And this is time. Uh, I started this study in 1976. So for those of you in the room who are younger than 37, um, this, these data are older than you are. Um, I was a somewhat precocious second year undergraduate um, at the time, and I didn't know when to stop, so I did it for 17 years, um, which is rather a long time. Um, but it, it's one of probably the most cited examples of a regime shift or a phase shift in a, in a coral reef system. Um, I went back to Jamaica this year for the first time in 20 years. And, and I went back to the study sites and recensus them. So I'll just call your attention to this data point, which comes from seven meters. So when I first went to that place in 1976 uh, as a 20-year-old, um, there was about 65% coral cover. And that's what it looks like today. So the phase shift that I described um, nearly 20 years ago now has basically locked in uh, in most places. So the coral cover, the last time I looked there 20 years ago, was about 5%. Um, today, it's 1.4 plus or minus 0.5. Um, and it's completely um, locked in uh, to this, what's sometimes called a, a, an alternate state. So I want to um, talk about alternate stable states and uh, regime shifts. Um, here's, before I do that, is another example of a, of a phase shift or a regime shift from this part of the world. So this is a picture that David Wackenfeld took um, relatively recently, a few years ago. And David's even older than me, so he took this picture on the left in 1883. And this is near Bowen, and you can see that a, a coral-dominated system is now pretty much um, a mudflat with uh, large amounts of macroalgae. So this reef has... Uh, can be thought of as having lost its resilience. It used to be able to cope with recurrent disturbances and bounce back to a coral-dominated state, but it can no longer um, do that. So um, in talking about regime shifts and phase shifts and resilience, I'm very conscious of the tremendous jargon load um, that's involved. Um, so I don't want you to read this slide. The point I want to make it here is that these bullet points represent eight different concepts. And for most of them, there's at least five words you can use to describe that concept. These words are more or less um, interchangeable. Um, so I, I want to spend a sh short portion of the talk um, explaining the resilience concept and, and related um, issues. So uh, this is basically the talk outline. I'm going to talk a little bit about resilience theory, and Nick, Nick um, did a good job of some of this. I'll talk about what, what are drivers, what are tipping points, what are feedbacks, what, what do we mean by hysteresis, and ass is not an insult um, to someone. It's alternate stable states. Um, then I want to ask the question, how do cumulative impacts, which is 
uh, very much a management priority at the moment, and multiple feedbacks and multiple drivers um, affect reefs, and, and this follows on very nicely from uh, s some of the results that Jamie was, was explaining. And as an aside uh, to that middle question, I want to look at uh, a controversy which is playing out in the literature over the last year or two, which is whether or not coral reefs uh, exhibit alternate stable states, yes or no. Um, so let me first of all uh, discuss what uh, I mean by drivers of change. Um, the, the main global driver of changes to ecosystems almost everywhere is human population growth as we exceed nine uh, billion people and how those people move around the surface of the planet. Another major driver is uh, wealth distribution and consumption patterns and evolving markets. So globalization of markets has driven demand for tropical hardwoods, for palm oil, uh, for fish, which are now a global commodity. So these are some of the very high level uh, drivers that we can uh, think of. Both of those have led to increased runoff from land because of deforestation, for, for instance, and agriculture, demand for sugarcane. Um, overfishing, increasingly driven by um, international and globalized markets for fish, and you'll hear a talk about that from uh, Mike Fabini uh, during the next few days. Invasive species which are being transported around increasingly by shipping, uh, and of course climate change. And these are sometimes referred to uh, by people as the threats to coral reefs. I don't particularly like the word threat. Um, I prefer to use driver, which is somewhat less um, value laden. Now, um, biologists, as uh, Nick explained uh, in reference to talking um, to his social science wife, um, are generally um, much more comfortable dealing with biology rather than a mix of biology and people. So these bullet points so far are, are, mo are more about what the ecosystem, are less about what the ecosystem's doing and they're more about what people are doing. But when biologists talk about threats, they often simplify what's in reality a complex social ecological dynamic into a dynamic that's purely biological. So uh, if you look at the coral reef literature, many people are much more comfortable dealing with what they might call approximate driver. Um, and the problem with proximate drivers is that they are often confused or confounded with ecosystem responses. So if you think of the response of an ecosystem as a y-axis and driver as the x-axis, often if you look at the biological literature, the drivers that people talk about are loss of biodiversity, habitat fragmentation, loss of three-dimensionality because the branching corals are dying, um, outbreaks of disease, outbreaks of crown of thorns. And to my mind, those are all ecosystem responses. So it, this is, there's the danger of a circularity if we talk about proximate drivers in, in this sense, because we're looking at the ecosystem response to other ecosystem responses. So um, I see some puzzled looks, so I'll try and explain that um, a bit more as I, as I continue. So to, uh, to capture the notion that drivers uh, everywhere are escalating and becoming uh, more of an issue, um, I spent about an hour on Google a few weeks ago and came up with these metrics of escalating human activity or drivers in the Great Barrier Reef catchment. So the variables I looked at were the size of the human population of Queensland, the number of recreational uh, uh, boat uh, licenses, the number of tons of coal being extracted, fertilizer use and sugarcane harvest. And I've scaled all of them from zero to 10, 10 being the maximum strength of that driver or driver proxy um, over the last 140 years or so. And, and, and I want to make two points with this graph. First is they're almost all escalating. The one exception is sugarcane harvesting has come down a little in the last few years. And the other point is that they're becoming more and more diverse. So back here, there are relatively few drivers uh, so coal mining and associated activities like um, dredging uh, have, have only become an issue in, in recent decades. So we, ha we have a global problem with escalating human impacts um, that are increasingly um, affecting 
uh, coral reef ecosystems. And uh, Jamie talked about some of the responses of the Barrier Reef to some of these escalating drivers. Um, so things like declining megafauna, loss of seagrasses, loss of corals have now been very well uh, documented. Uh, all of those contribute to the distortion of food webs, uh, either top down or, or bottom up. Um, we're seeing increased levels of bleaching disease and starfish outbreaks, which I would argue are symptoms of the drivers rather than being proximate drivers um, themselves. And as the picture that Dave Wackenfeld took uh, before and after shows, there's a, an, an increasing loss of resilience uh, to natural events like cyclones and, and flood events, particularly on, on nearshore um, reefs. So what I'd like to do now is um, look in a bit more detail at how organisms, populations, and ecosystems respond to some of these um, escalating drivers. So if we think of the response of, let's say, a coral reef ecosystem to uh, a, an increasingly strong driver, the response is, is very rarely linear. Um, generally, the response accelerates as the driver gets stronger, and that's simply a, an empirical observation. So we tend to get a relationship like this. So this is the state of the ecosystem uh, at equilibrium, so we can think of it as being coral dominated when these combinations of drivers are at a, are at a very low level, so we're dealing with near pristine conditions back here. As these get stronger and stronger, instead of responding linearly, we tend to get a curved response which I've shown here as something approximating a threshold response. Now, the reason why that isn't linear is because of the concept of feedbacks. And feedbacks can either be destabilizing, so-called positive feedbacks, which makes the curve steeper, or they can be negative uh, uh, feedbacks, which cause the, the slope of, of the response to flatten out uh, and to asymptote like that. Um, so what's the evidence that these feedbacks um, exist? Um, I'll get to that in a second. Um, this graph here basically shows the uh, response of the ecosystem in, in these two dimensions, where this is the state of the ecosystem and that's the driver. In the next graph, I'll show you a three-dimensional variation of this, where the strength of the driver um, is, is weak or strong. So if you look at this top graph, I've just shown you these two axes with this sort of response where there is a steep response in that part of the curve. If the feedbacks are weak, we get a very smooth, almost linear response. As the feedbacks strengthen, the curve in, in this response steepens, so it becomes a threshold about here. And if the feedbacks get stronger still, the curve can actually fold in on itself which uh, Nick, Nick described, it's sometimes called a catastrophe curve. And in this case, um, there's a smooth response, uh, but, but if there's a, a catastrophe curve happening because of very strong feedbacks, then uh, the path backways is different from the path forwards. So I'll now have a look at these two graphs on the bottom. So if the feedbacks are weak, this is uh, scenario B here, then as the driver increases, we get a smooth response. And if the driver is, is reduced, we'll get a smooth response backwards along the same pathway. If, however, we get uh, this kind of response with a cusp or a catastrophe curve, then once the system reaches this threshold here, it will collapse to the degraded state. And if we reduce the driver, it won't go back up that way because it can't jump up it has to go back all the way to this threshold shown here before the reverse phase shift can occur. So the term alternate stable states refers to this scenario where between that level of driver here and this level of driver there, there are two possible states of the system. It can either continue to be coral dominated or it can flip, often very unexpectedly, into the alternate uh, state, which which is uh, often dominance by macroalgae. So that basically is the theory behind um, the importance of feedbacks in generating hysteresis. Hysteresis is the displacement 
along the y-axis of these two thresholds. So if hysteresis is strong, then this region of alternate stable states is broad. If hysteresis is absent, then there is no alternate stable states. So what is the um, actual evidence uh, that these uh, feedbacks actually occur? Well, if you look in the literature, um, there's actually very scattered uh, evidence for 19 different types of feedbacks. Um, some of them are negative, so they're um, stabilizing. Um, others, most of them, are positive, so they're destabilizing, which makes the response of the ecosystem to a driver steeper and will tend to make it more likely to be hysteretic. Um, now, I'm going to intersperse this talk, time permitting, with a couple of diatribes. Um, so I'll, I'll give you my first one. Um, you'll never find these 19 different feedbacks by doing a web of science search for the keyword feedback because the, the evidence and discussion about these feedbacks are buried deep inside papers that don't have feedbacks in the title, the abstract, or the keywords. And in the literature, there's a, a growing tendency for people to do a, a quick and dirty a web of science survey using keywords, and they kid themselves into thinking that they then know the literature. And so the point of my diatribe is that there really is no substitute for actually reading the papers rather than doing, than doing some sort of glorified Google search. So here are three examples um, that show evidence for these um, three different types of, of, uh, of feedbacks. So the feedbacks are out there. Um, we don't monitor feedbacks, and there's uh, only fairly scant evidence for how prevalent many of these feedbacks are in nature. So we focused on three of them. Uh, one is a predator-prey interaction. So in the existing models of coral reef hysteresis and regime shifts, this is the positive feedback which has been focused on by people like Pete Mumby and uh, other groups of modelers um, around the world. And this feedback basically said it's about uh, swamping of predators, where in this case the predator is, is herbivorous fish or sea urchins. And it basically the premise is, is if, if there's too much macroalgae in the system and not enough fish, then the macroalgae uh, will, will run away from the rate of herbivory because of swamping by the herbivores. Two other feedbacks that are well described in the broader ecological literature are feedbacks due to competition. If interspecific inter competition is uh, stronger than intraspecific competition, you get a positive feedback. And we, we also see some evidence in the coral reef literature of a feedback between coral habitat and the amount of herbivory. Uh, this is work by people like Nick Graham and Sean Wilson and uh, Morgan Pratchett and others, uh, which basically says if you have a highly three-dimensional coral-dominated system, it's a good place for fish, particularly larval fish, to be, and that promotes high levels of herbivory. Whereas if you lose the corals and macroalgae start to dominate, then you, you get a, a very different kind of dynamic. So um, this is a summary of the maths of the model that we, uh, we constructed. Um, I should have mentioned at the front that the co-author on this talk is, uh, is a, a PhD student uh, from the Netherlands, uh, Ingrid van Linkput. Um, she's a, a very gifted mathematician, so this is the model that she can... Uh, constructed and modified. This model is actually well, very well known in the ecological literature. Um, it was first used by Bob May in, I think, 1977. And it's basically a set of four equations that describe the dynamics of space, macroalgae, corals, and herbivores. And I don't have time to go through it, but basically S is free space. And this equation says that the amount of space is equal to the sum of the coral cover, the macroalgal cover, subtracted uh, and those sum up to one, basically, along with bare space. So what we did with this model is we modified it to incorporate those three different uh, feedbacks. And as I said, uh, existing models of coral reef regime shifts have only focused on uh, one of those um, three feedbacks um, that I'll now explain. So we incorporated these three feedbacks, and the bits in yellows here are how we modified these equations to incorporate the swamping feedback, the competition feedback, and the habitat 
uh, three-dimensionality um, feedback. Now, um, diatribe number two. Um, we could show anything we like with this model simply by choosing the parameter values of these different things. Um, and that's been a criticism in the contemporary coral reef monitoring literature that it's not really a great surprise that if you parameterize a model with a very strong hysteretic, hysteretic parameter that the model will demonstrate hysteresis. So I would urge caution on the students in the room that models don't demonstrate anything. Um, they make predictions or they show you what's plausible. Uh, but you, you, you run a grave risk of, uh, of, um, of kidding yourself um, if, you, if you make the assumption that the model actually demonstrates things. So we're going to take the opposite approach here, and we're going to make these feedbacks really, really weak. And so what, I, what I'll do now is show you the dynamics of a coral reef system, first with no feedbacks, and then with very weak feedbacks uh, individually for each of these three. So that's what this graph is. So the axis here is the, uh, the cover or abundance of corals, macroalgae and herbivores, plotted as a response to this driver, which is um, fishing effort. So as fishing effort increases, if we have no feedbacks in our model, then obviously the number of fish declines. And as the number of fish declines, because they're herbivores, the amount of algae goes up. And because algae compete with corals for space, the amount of corals goes down. So with no feedbacks in our model, that's a, quite a smooth response. There isn't hysteresis. There are no alternate stable states with no feedbacks in the model. And then these three graphs are almost the same because we've added each of these feedbacks, but with very weak parameterization of the model. So weak feedbacks acting individually make very little difference to the dynamics of the system. What we did next is combine these three feedbacks. We still left them very, very weak. So weak that each of them individually had no impact on the dynamics. But when we put them in combination into our model with the same parameter settings, all hell breaks loose. So this is the mathematical equivalent of a, an atom bomb going on. So, so the combined effect of these three weak feedbacks is to generate strong hysteresis because they're acting synergistically. All of them are positive feedbacks that reinforce a transition from corals to macroalgae. And when they act together, they produce this sudden collapse and alternate stable states, which is all the squiggly bits in the middle here. So the point of the, the, uh, the simulation is that even very weak feedbacks that individually are insignificant can generate an unexpected collapse of the ecosystem. So we could, in, in theory or in practice, have figured out what the threshold level of nutrients is that's safe, or the threshold level of pH that's safe, or the threshold level of temperature that's safe. But when those things are combined, um, we could get a very uh, different dynamic, which is completely um, unexpected. OK, going back to uh, the outline for the talk, I'll come back to that middle question, but I want to very quickly deal with this issue, which is, do coral reefs exhibit alternate stable states? It's presented very much in the contemporary literature as a black and white question. And I'm basically going to argue it's a silly question, um, because if you use our model and vary these feedbacks, you can very easily show that by varying these three parameters, which is the strength of the feedback, you can have a smooth response or a hysteretic response. So this one represents, for, in, for instance, variation in the palatability of, of uh, macroalgae, which depends on sp spatial variation in species composition. This represents fluctuations in coral recruitment, and that uh, represents variations in how we uh, manage fisheries. So the point of this simulation is that Hysteresis, and therefore alternate stable states in coral reef systems, is likely to be very ephemeral. It can be switched on or off depending on the strength of these individual feedbacks and depending on how many of them are switched on or off at any one place and at any one time. So there is no yes, no answer to 
the question, do coral reefs show um, hysteresis in alternate stable states? Because the answer is, yes, they do sometimes, some places. Um, I'll just wrap up with um, this slide and a follow-up to it. This is a graph from a paper that Dave Bellwood, myself, and two others wrote uh, in about 10 years ago now, where we began to explore the uh, consequences of multiple drivers. So this is uh, pollution on this axis and fishing pressure on that. And the point of this graphic, um, which you might call a heuristic graphic or a concept diagram, gram, was that, first of all, more than just the transition to macroalgae is possible. Um, it also posits that at low levels of pollution and low levels of fishing, we'll get healthy reefs, but as those, either of those drivers increase, they'll become increasingly stressed, and finally they'll switch to something else. Now, um, the basis for this diagram lies somewhere deep in the recesses of David Bellwood's brain, um, which might be a bit scary. Um, but what this model that I've just described allows us to do is build on this concept, uh, and that's what this slide shows here. So here are examples of two drivers, nutrients and fishing, or climate change and fishing, and I could have plotted uh, climate change versus nutrients. And it shows, but in a mechanistically much richer way, the sort of concept that David and I and others talked about um, in that older nature paper. So here's our pristine state. As these drivers increase in strength, we enter an increasingly risky state where we could easily flip to macroalgae. And finally, at high levels of these drivers, the only possibility is the, is the degraded state. The reason these lines aren't parallel is because of synergies between these two drivers. And in fact, we can go one step further and do a three-dimensional version of that, where I've plotted three drivers, fishing pressure, climate change, and nutrient runoff. So we can think of this orange place down here under near pristine conditions as a safe operating space for coral reefs. Um, you can think of this as a graph through time. So if we go back a thousand years, then all of the world's coral reefs were down in this left corner. Think of it as a thousand data points that over time are drifting into the back corner of this diagram. So now many of the world's coral reefs are likely to be in this risky area where they could unexpectedly flip to macroalgae. If hysteresis is strong, then this blue area will be very broad. If hysteresis is weak, then, or non-existent, then the orange state will transform gradually into the macroalgal state. So even if you don't believe in the concept of alternate stable states, I think this graphic is very uh, useful in showing in a mechanistic way the uh, multiple impacts of, of multiple um, drivers. The reason this surface here is curved is because the impact on a coral reef of fishing and climate change is contingent on the strength of pollution. So we're, we're beginning to get a better understanding of how these drivers um, uh, inter interact. So to summarize all of that, um, I think it's uh, fair to say that we, we need a much better uh, understanding of why coral reefs decline, why they're responding in particular ways to escalating drivers, not simply whether coral cover is going up or going down. Um, clearly, climate change, runoff, and overfishing are the three big issues um, that have to be addressed. And the point of the way that they're interacting, as demonstrated uh, by many different studies, uh, is that we have to grapple with all three simultaneously. And thirdly, prevention is better than cure, particularly in a system that has strong uh, hysteresis. Um, but reversed phase shifts can and do happen, particularly if the feedbacks are weak, and Nick, Nick talked very eloquently to that issue. And finally, reefs aren't doomed if we act quickly, uh, but the decisions we make now on coral reef protection will have profound uh, long-term consequences. I argued in a paper that I published earlier this year in TREE that we may already be living on borrowed time. We may be already living in the hysteretic zone, the blue zone in that three-dimensional graph. The good thing about borrowed time is that it does afford us an opportunity to reduce the drivers or to manage the feedbacks, 
so that we can uh, move back into the safe operating space for coral reefs. Thanks very much.